It started out as a fear, which then grew into a hope, which then turned into a quiet thought, which then turned into uh, My name is Yana, and I'm part of a group called The Connected Artist, and it is a group created by a London-based UK artist, Alice Sheridan, and as part of that group, she's been uh, challenging us to take hold of our technology, take hold of being more visible, um, and sharing not only our work, but just who we are and what we do. And so that's why I'm here today. But I wanted to talk to you about a question that has been coming up for me, and it's been coming up for my students. I teach watercolor technique and color theory and that means I don't really teach people how to paint. I teach them the techniques, I give them the things so that they can create their own work. But it raises the question of um, if you know how to paint but you aren't painting as much as you'd like to, what's getting in the way? And I have a couple ideas about that. Uh, I had a a fear, which then grew into a hope, which then turned into a quiet thought, which then turned into a quiet... I had a quote at the beginning of this um, live stream by Degas, and um, he says something like, painting is easy when you don't know how, but it's very difficult when, when you do. And so that speaks both to the technical part of painting, like the, the more you know, the more you know you don't know, and that it, your eyes get opened up to something as soon as you start exploring it. So at the very least, if you're a beginning painter and you start to work with watercolor, you find out pretty quickly that um, it's not as easy as maybe an experienced painter makes it look and you also start to become aware of your technical gap. You know, the difference between what you can do and what you can imagine and, and what you might like to be doing um, as a painter. And so that's one part of it. You know, just having the technical knowledge, um, understanding the grammar behind painting, knowing how to work with the different media, how much water do I put in my brush, um, how much, paint do I use, all of those things that you have to learn kind of incrementally and um, then there comes the application of the paint and uh, how to do glazing and there's different elements to the process of watercolor that make it technically challenging. But if you have a good command of the technique and you understand um, the grammar of painting and you're still not painting, then that, that makes us maybe want to look a little deeper into the why am I not painting more? And so I'm kind of curious about what you all think about why that is. I know we all have, we're busy, we have chores and we have errands to run and we have kids that get sick or um, big things happen. Um, trouble with your car or a blizzard. There's all kinds of reasons. But there are also plenty of times I know in my day where I actually could be painting and I'm not. And that's the question that I'm really trying to answer for myself. And I'm trying to help my students answer that question too. And more and more I'm aware of um, how the parallels between art making and life itself and the more integrated and connected we are to ourselves the more integrated our art will be and so i think that's one thing we could look at is is art something that's outside of ourselves is it's that thing i do over there or is it just part like breathing is it part of the rhythm of your day um, and if it's not how could we make it more like breathing something that is just sort of flows from us and feels natural. Um, but I do think the Degas quote 
kind of hits a nail on the head in a way is that as soon as you embark on this thing to be a painter, you realize that just like the single cell seems mm, simple on the outside, if you could look inside of it, you would see there was a whole universe there. And that's kind of how a painting is. It, it looks simple um, until you know a little bit about it. And when you start sort of decoding it and getting inside that painting, trying to get inside the artist's mind, how did they do that? What were they thinking? What process did they use? Uh, what steps did they take to get this result? You realize that you're peering into a mini universe. <laughs> Um, but that's one of the things I really love about painting and that's one of the things that I love about teaching people the technique of painting, the techniques needed for making a painting. And um, maybe I'm thinking about this more because my birthday is tomorrow and uh, I, I'll be 57. Um, so as you get older you get a little more reflective about the passing of time and how old you are and how much time you have left to do something that you love. Um, right. um, as I think about my later years and I think about my student population, which is mostly people who um, are at a time in their life where they have um, interests, they have time, they have health, and they can indulge in um, pursuing a passion of painting um, because they put it off. Maybe they had a career, or they were raising a family, or their finances didn't allow. And now they finally have a little space where they're capable of um, taking on this new challenge of painting. And um, I think painting is worthy as a pastime, it, just for the sake of painting. Uh, you don't have to be a professional artist. You don't have to um, decide to make it a career. But when I think about what I wanna do in life at, as I get older, um, I'm observing people who are older than me and their their external life is getting smaller. You know, they're going out less or um, even if they have a lot of energy, they're not um, able to do things like they were when they were younger. But painting enables us to make our world big when it gets small. And if we take up the discipline of painting, at an age or time where we have um, those things I said. We have a little bit of space around us. We can maybe invest a little bit in lessons and um, getting together with other people. We have some time. If we can capitalize on that while we have the opportunity, then when our world starts to get small, we can expand in different ways. And, you know, the same might be true of other handicrafts like um, maybe knitting or crochet or needlework. But even my friends who do needlework and things like that, with age, they find that it's more difficult to either see what they're doing or their, um, their hands are stiff or whatever. What are some of the barriers to making your own? Um, sorry about all the crashing. We are getting ready for First Friday and this place is kind of busy. I've already put people on hold a couple times while I tried to make my little Instagram live um, promo for this moment, um, but they've got to keep working because we're opening in a couple hours to the public. And we usually have two to 300 people come through the studios, so um, I won't be keeping myself or you guys much longer, but I did want to show you something from one of my journals, just a second. One of the things I do in my art practice is I travel. And then one of the things I do for students is that I plan trips and we go abroad and we study with other artists and we hunt for sketches. Um, and we just try to integrate more this idea of that we wanna be making our art and we like traveling, so how do we do that together? And honestly, it's a little bit like, it's a little, little bit like camping and trying to make art. It's, it's not, it takes some endurance and you kind of have to train for it like you would train for a marathon. If you're not drawing on a day where the conditions are great, then you're probably not gonna be drawing on a day when they're challenging, like you're jet lagged or 
uh, you just packed all your gear out and now it's raining. So it's good to start your training for journaling and making art on the road when you don't have as many obstacles when you're at home. Here's my journal. I started this one in March and it is uh, from my trip to England. Uh, here's a couple of my students there in their little sketch. You can see. But the reason I'm gonna show you this is there's an artist I felt inspired by. I got to, here, I'll let you view while I talk. That's the Denver International Airport. There's a guy on the train. I tried to not let him know that I was drawing and painting him while I was painting him. Um, I like to do contour drawings when I go places just to capture the feeling of the place. And this is in a village in Yorkshire called Saltaire. And um, we went and saw the David Hockney exhibit. And that's the man I want to tell you about, David Hockney. And this is my version of a little Hockney uh, feeling painting. I actually took a photo from the train as we were zooming along. And I tried to paint it in the style or colors that I thought David Hockney might um, paint it. And here, I'll get him closer so you can see him. But my takeaway from the um, exhibit in Saltaire at um, the salt mill is that David Hockney didn't stop producing his art. And now that he's in his 80s, he still is making his art. And one of the ways he's doing that is he drives out on his lane and he uses his iPad Pro to paint what he sees. And he did a, a project where he went out every day for a year and I actually don't know if he's still doing that, but he, he spent every day going out to his lane and painting what he saw. And that's now in a traveling exhibit in England and other places. But what, what stood out to me about David Hockney is that his, his life is getting smaller. He's not dragging his easel out. He's not walking down the lane. He's driving. Um, but he's still finding a way to do his work. And he hasn't stopped practicing his craft. And not only has he not stopped practicing, but he's adopted technology. And he started out with an iPhone, a smartphone, making little drawings and sending them to people he was connected to when he first learned to use a, a smartphone and then he graduated to an iPad and and he just keeps going and well that's kind of why I'm here today because I want to keep going and I want to keep making my art and being here with you today is um, one way for me to bridge that te technology gap you know I have, we have worldwide reach now and I have friends who um, I'm connected to in other places and yet it, it feels like they're my neighbor because of this technology. And I don't, I don't want to be limited um, in my growth because um, I don't want to stand here and talk to you live. Because I really do, actually. And I want to think less about how I feel doing it or what it means for me to do it. Than I, and I want to think more about how it's a tool that can help me share with you. It started out as a fear, which then grew into hope. I've enjoyed this time with you. Now I'm going to go get ready for First Friday. Thanks for tuning in.